competitive advantages, um, why is this good for Dropbox? Uh, cost, performance, agility, I'll go through all of these independently. I think the agility one's kind of a fun one and maybe one that you might not expect. Um, the first is cost. Uh, we mentioned earlier, in this particular period in time, I can't go into the finances of the company any, any level of detail. One thing I can talk about is just the replacement cost on our hardware, right? And this stat here. So we have a 50 cents on the dollar replacement cost on our hardware. So that means when hardware goes out of life cycle, that goes through a lifetime in production, when we replace it, they're 50% they're, you know, of the cost of, of, of what they're replacing. Uh, that's driven by a number of factors, including just the never-ending march of, of, of hardware and, and Moore's law, et cetera. Um, but also optimizations on the software stack. Stuff like going from a lot of RAM uh, on a storage box to you know, less than 100 uh, gigabytes of RAM for a petabyte of storage. These things uh, drive down our, our, our costs heavily. Uh, compute databases and storage, all these three uh, factors in the, in the cost equation. We have talked primarily about storage uh, in this talk right now, but obviously we have a pretty large database and, uh, and com compute stack as well. Performance. Our users don't really care that much about cost, right? They <laughs> kind of care about these other things. That's, cost is our business. Um, performance. So as Dimitri said, we have these POPs. They actually have a very a notable increase in performance in perceived performance by our users. We're seeing up to 3x uh, increase in, uh, well, I think that's in 3x reduction in sync time. So when the user's using the desktop client. Um, so that that's, comes from a pretty heavy investment in these POPs and trying to get as close as we can to the user, along with internal optimizations that have come along with, say, building Magic Pocket and, and improving our, our systems over time. Um, so and then you, agility. Uh, so, yeah. You mentioned the 50% uh, of uh, life cycle costs. Uh, so what's a typical server last in your environment? I, you know, it's, how long is, what's a life cycle for us? Uh, it's a different server? on compute and storage. I think we generally Let's say target. storage. Yeah. It's about four to five years. Four to five years? Yeah. yeah. And, and you, during, during that time, um, our internal technology has improved significantly as, yeah, yeah. as, as well. Yeah. You obviously have a large number of, grow, well, gr large growing number of servers. How do you manage them with, it, with them being dual source from different OEM vendors, you can't use the same ILO or lights out yeah. capability. So do you use something generic like Redshift or how do you manage them? That's a pretty big question. Yeah, so I, I, I can probably talk to you offline about that, but we actually, I mean, we do use ILO. We do use standard BMC functions. Um, and that's, those are one of the challenges that, that we actually take on um, as sort of like on, on, on the tooling side for our team. And there's actually a big endeavor for that um, that's going on right now and continuing forward. So. There's like a lot of dimensions to that yeah. question. For example, yeah. like we want to abstract the hardware as much as we can. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes it's not easy. Like uh, when you allocate uh, a disk in the storage node, different vendors have different uh, diagnostic tools. And, right. and so we have SREs, so site reliability engineers, who sometimes will work on tooling to, to wrap this to provide a more abstracted interface to the developers. Um, stuff like, like they said, the RAID cards were a, were a hassle, right? Because yeah. you've you got to have different systems to manage them independently. Yeah. Um, different generations of networks have ha been quite annoying to manage as well. Um, yeah. uh, and the, then there's the hardware management, and there's also how do we manage just the, uh, the software, like the, the, yeah. what services run on which machines, for example. Uh, right now, it's fairly static. So, um, Meaning, you know, we have a we have a we have internal systems that do this. There's not much off the shelf going on. But you know, when you're a developer, you write some software, uh, you write a kind of configuration in a language that we have, and uh, the the system will go and deploy that on some free machines based on some requirements you have. Uh, and then, in most of the time, it will just sit there until the machine fails. We're not like shuffling all the time all the hardware around, or our services around. But that's that's based on a pretty custom stack yeah. um, that we run. Did that answer the question? I guess there's... Yeah, yeah. kind of. Yep. Anything else specific that, so, that you had? So machine no. sits there for five years. You don't do much with it then. Yeah. After it's all set up, it's just there, and you don't touch it anymore. Well, disks, right? Disks might be replaced. Or what something. happens to disks? Disks get, disks get physically shredded. 
Yeah, um, okay, but yeah. from a software perspective, you don't do oh, it's much. Change, no, it's changing all the time. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's d developers in the company writing a lot of software. Most of that software is not storage. Most of the software is the Dropbox application stack. That's getting pushed to production many times once a day. Okay. Um, the storage team pushes a release to production every week. Um, every single week. Now, we have a rolling release process, so there's multiple versions in production at any period of time. But every single week, there is changes happening to the, to the storage system, mm -hmm. um, mostly around uh, cost efficiency, performance, um, reliability initiatives. Um, but this, it's a very active project. Yep. You see, at the beginning, you mentioned that you moved away from AWS overall, mainly because of, of, of the cost um, because of your scale. So when you did that cost-benefit analysis, which I'm guessing would have been done at a very high, deeper level, do you take into account just the sort of infrastructure cost, or do you take into account the soft costs like the TCO stuff, like you know, having to manage those tooling, man, man, manpower, or whatever? Yeah, so I'll first challenge that first assertion, and then I'll answer the question. I, th there's a lot of reasons for Dropbox operating its own storage that aren't just cost-driven. A lot of them come down to the stuff like uh, performance, agility, uh, the ability to customize our own stack, provide um, better services. Um, but in terms of, yes, evaluating the cost of a product like this, 100% comes down to like, not just the hard drives, but the cost of the teams, right? And, and uh, the cost of every, and that's why like, it's, it requires an organization of our size to uh, pull off an issue like this in a, in a mature way because you, you can't underestimate how much you have to invest in building a team of, of, of network engineers and, um, and su supply chain team and hardware and, and, um, and site reliability engineers, right? Um, that's a good segue, though, into agility, which is when you have those people, that can be a really great thing, right? Because those people are not just only doing storage, right? They're leveling up the company as a whole in terms of the technical competency, right? So, so we're able to take those people and then build the, the pops. Like, you know, that, that is kind of almost a side effect of us building our infrastructure. Now we have all these network engineers. Now we have the ability to, to go and, and develop that, right? And we can build much more sophisticated internal services. Even in the process of building a very, very large system like this, we improved a lot of our internal tooling, like our release process, our, our cluster management, and, and how we do visibility. The monitoring, all that stuff improved in the process. So we got a lot of benefits out of that, but they do count as, as part of the cost of the project, for sure. Um, one thing I'll say about it, agility, I mentioned this before, Dropbox is not just the private cloud advocate company. We sit in the spectrum between uh, public cloud and private cloud. We like to see this is the best of both worlds. We can leverage external providers when we get a benefit from that, but then leverage you know, the fact that we have deep expertise in certain areas. Um, what do we get from the public cloud? So we get European storage, right? We couldn't have just gone, like I said before, and just built a data center there straight away and had a team, right? We can leverage a third party. We can use Amazon S3 for this, and that's just fine, right? Because it's about bringing value to the users. Um, stuff like uh, we use ElastiCache. Um, ElastiCache, the, um, what's, the, what's the CDN? Cloudfront. Cloudfront. Cloudfront, Cloudfront. ElastiCache <laughs> is the memcache thing. Cloud, we use. AWS uh, CloudFront for um, distributing binaries of the desktop client. And part, part of the reason for that is we have 500 million users or so. When they want, we want to update, if we have an update, we want to push it out pretty quickly. You have a huge influx of these 500 million users who want to fetch this binary. It makes sense for us to use a third party to handle that traffic. Right? So they, they, they do the caching for that. Um, also, just real like, new and experimental features. If we want to do some cool AI stuff or machine learning. We want to use um, you know, like um, hardware accelerated um, AI uh, platforms, for example. We don't have to go out and build a data center full of, of these machines. We can just leverage a third party for this. Or you know, we can use uh, SQS or, or SES or all these services Amazon or other providers have um, to avoid us having to build that in-house. Then we have the private cloud benefits, which we've said basically already. We tailor the hardware to our use cases very particularly. We have that close integration now between the hardware and the software teams um, and, and the network stack. And that might bring us towards the end. The three benefits here, I'll leave that on, this, on the slide. Um, so this is the end of the talk officially, but we can answer questions on almost everything. 
So maybe detailed cost questions. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, cool. So with where you're going as well, as a business, obviously you specialty in storage and using that platform for collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any plans in the future to potentially start expanding beyond that use case to provide just storage as, I don't know, S3 slash whatever to other use cases? Yeah, given the interesting question. So I'm speculating on company strategy here, right? So I want to be careful about what I say there. Right? So Dropbox has, a, has a, a very strong strategy around collaboration and improving, increasing that scope. Uh, the question is, does it make sense for a company like Dropbox to just be an infrastructure as a service company? And currently, it doesn't make sense for us to do that. Um, we, we see this as a value add company, not necessarily a race to the bottom company. We want to provide a, a, an actual, like, deeply valuable user experience rather than just be the utility. Um, so in terms of, you know, our current business, am I making comms nervous right now talking about uh, <laughs> the current business, I, I don't think it's in line with, with, with right. where we're at right now. You know, we're really driving towards like getting closer to the to the user, providing better user experiences. Um, the question comes up, but you, the the intention of Magic Pocket, for example, really was a, around like improving the Dropbox experience for the users, and then being a platform for say if you want to do. Um, better handling of that content in-house, like just say we do. Uh, there's things people don't realize. For example, if you upload a, a, a Word document to, to Dropbox, we uh, convert it to a PDF preview uh, within, I think, about a second, so you can view it on your mobile device if you don't have Word on your mobile device. You know, If you upload a video to Dropbox, we'll H.264 encode uh, the first five seconds of that video, so if you want to stream it on your mobile device or on your computer, we can send the, the pre-transcoded mm. start of the video and then the background catch up and transcode the rest. So these are the kind of things that we kind of leverage as well by having that deep control of the infrastructure. It's not necessarily to position ourselves as an infrastructure as a service com company. We're more the collaboration, you know, content company. 